screenshot shows the tarnished using these golden porcupine spines, the same ones utilized by this hippo. deformed hippo enemy after it charges. And the sound it makes is just like a crucible spell. True reaver demons. Oh, go ahead, upgrade the hippo, one of the deadliest mammals on earth, with porcupine spines. Thank you. Hello everybody, Jack here with another reaction. So thank you so much for the uh, great reception to my reaction slash breakdown to the past Elden Ring video that I made on the new DLCs trailer. It was amazing and I loved the awesome feedback and the many theories that a lot of you had. Some of them were pretty much uh, matching mine and some were absolutely <laughs> new to me and very good. Especially those regarding Marika's involvement in this and I'm very much intrigued in what she has in store. What else? else did she have to do? Who else did she have to kill or manipulate as yet another means to an end? Obviously, we are only going to figure it out fully when the DLC comes out, a massive freaking DLC. But in the meantime, we'll be checking out a video from Vati Vija who has this 40 minute long video on the lore of uh, this uh, trailer. Now, obviously, a lot of this is going to be speculation and as many of you already must have had, I too saw the interviews that were made with Miyazaki or these transcripts on, from these interviews, which I tried translating with Google Translate. Only some of the fact can be understood, but not fully, which is why I've been checking this one out today. So without further ado, let us jump into Low Daddy's video. <laughs> So the gameplay trailer for the Shadow of the Erd Tree DLC just dropped, and it's also extremely story heavy. Pure and radiant, he wields love to shrive clean the hearts of men. And this Mikula. is very much the story of Mikola. Let's learn what we can. There is nothing more terrifying. You'll recognize Mikola's cocoon here. It's located in Mogwin Palace and that is the DLC access point that will give way to this. What they're calling the Land of Shadow, a place that you can explore on June 21st as long as you've defeated Moog and Radan. According to Miyazaki, the DLC is at least the same size as Limgrave in the base game. And this will be their largest DLC to date. Just to mention, this man said in the past the Elden Ring would be a game that should only take about 30 hours to complete. Well, I, I guess a similar claim was made regarding Armored Core. Like, <laughs> FromSoft games are so amazing because they truly draw you in and once you actually get there, you've been spending like 200 hours just to finish the main story. <laughs> it's wonderful. In that forsaken place, blood must spill. Blood of your fellows. They are truly faithful. Interviews also reveal that there will be eight new weapon categories and at least ten new bosses. And we're all You're getting nerfed. What has happened to be on the losing side of a war? Oh, Enemies that here are the vestiges of a war that occurred in the Land of Shadow long ago. They've just been obscured by the Erd Tree until now. So many feature designs that would be considered cursed or blasphemous in the lands between. And there's no better example of that than the newest member of Marika's family, Mesmer. Mesmer. Mother, wouldst thou truly lordship sanction in one so bereft of life? Yeah, and this We're was confirmed. We're entering the DLC as a tarnished that was sanctioned to become Elden Lord. But it seems events in the base game might pale in comparison to what's playing out here with Mikola, who arrived long before we did. I presume you too are keen to know. Oh. Just what kind Mikola is doing here. So let's talk about everything. I have analyzed every frame, translated every interview, and kind of haven't slept in two days. So <laughs> good night, and I hope you enjoy. Those stripped on the race of gold shall all meet death in the race of Lesmus flame. Come now, touch the withered arm and travel to the realm of shadow. I will not be far behind. May we meet again. 
Um, I need to make an interjection here. That is regarding the music of this. There was a thing, uh, I was frequenting some friends uh, years ago when I was much younger, when I was getting into music, like I play bass. I haven't practiced for, for a while now, but I should really get back to it. But the point is, uh, these guys um, were violinists and not to live up to some stereotype, they were Asians, but there's a point to this, okay? Uh, <laughs> a lot of their family members also were like from musical families. And we had this thing where we basically said that no matter what you do, you can always find like Asian artists that are going to improve on a genre that is not like that does not originate from them necessarily. Like I've seen this in animes, for example, uh, one of my favorite of all time called Bleach has these uh, like very Spanish inspired music from uh, a group or gang called the Espada that is so amazing that I've seen actual Spanish uh, like um, uh, Olympian make use of them during the routines and stuff like that. And when it comes to the music from like Elden Ring or Souls Gamers in general, it, like a lot of the music just keeps you out of the chokehold, like it feels so good. Now people are gonna say that, oh you're Jack, you're into BDSM, no that's not what I said. I'm just stating that the music is very good and despite, well I guess my preconception that this is not a genre that stems from a certain place, but the fact that it is made so much better by them, I think is super cool. Before we break down the story, I'm going to highlight what I think are three of the biggest gameplay details that I found hidden in some translated interviews. First, Elden Ring's DLC will actually feature a new power scaling feature that will come into play while you're in the Land of Shadow. Yeah. Here, our character will be able to upgrade their attack power in a way that is separate from your rune level. Let me explain that. So. Miyazaki mentions that this system is somewhat similar to how attack power works in Sekiro. In Sekiro, mm -hmm. you don't level attributes to do more damage like you would do in Elden Ring. Instead, your attack power can be raised by defeating certain bosses and claiming their memories. Yeah. So a system like this is being added to Elden Ring and it will be a new way to get stronger in the DLC. And it, it would also make sense if like it is a land of shadow that is building upon what we already have given from the interview the understanding is that this has nothing to do with like going in the past or in the future if it is sh shadowing the stuff that we already have then it should be additive but not like in the sense of just adding more points into a system that we already have but something entirely different in addition to using runes to level up as you're used to the reason this is being added is because From Software know that there are a lot of players who will be going into the DLC at high levels with mm. their completed characters. And so instead of having players with completed characters just steamrolling the content, they want players to have that classic experience of struggling against bosses and needing to explore other areas to get stronger and to try again. Yeah, so stripped of the grace of gold. a new attack power resource and hopefully also by scaling our characters appropriately, I think this idea could be genius. And oh. it's especially important for a game like Elden Ring to have this, because this game will live or die by the enormous, expensive world it has, and you need to want or need to explore that world. Next, of course the DLC will be getting many new weapons, but most interesting is that these new weapons span eight, eight new weapon categories. Elden Ring already had a ton of weapon types, so getting eight more is actually kind of insane. So far we know six of these new categories. One is the dueling shield, which combines yeah. offense and defense. Which, haven't we already seen this in previous Elden Ring trailers? I could have sworn that we have. I must be having like a weird sense of deja vu or like a Mandela effect, but I'm more less certain that we've seen this in previous trailers. Another are these reverse grip swords that we see being wielded in this clip. 
And then there's weapons that enable a martial Dark arts Souls. style, reminiscent of the Dragon Bone Fist from Dark Souls 2, or the Senpo Monks from Sekiro. Yeah. Miyazaki also mentions a large Japanese sword and a new large sword, whatever that means. <laughs> but personally, I'm most excited for these. These are equipable throwing weapons where all of your melee attacks are thrown attacks. Elden Ring always had really smooth ranged gameplay, but mm. the weapons were so bad that it just wasn't worth playing. So I really hope these are viable. Uh, anyway, the third gameplay point I want to mention is that, again, Miyazaki says that the DLC area should be at least the same size as Limgrave. But you need to bear in mind, this is coming from the same humble man who told everyone that Elden Ring would take yeah. about 30 hours to complete. So I yeah. wouldn't be surprised if Miyazaki is underselling the size of the DLC here, if anything. But that's enough about gameplay for now. Let's get into Let's the lore. lore. Shortly after the DLC trailer released, I received an email from Namco Bandai about it, and they included this short poem. Oh boy. It reads, The Land of Shadow. A place obscured by the Ode Tree, where the goddess Marika first set foot. A land purged in an unsung battle, set ablaze by Mesmer's flame. It was to this land that Mikola departed, divesting himself of his flesh, his strength, his lineage, of all things golden. Whoa. Can we just appreciate just how cool it is to like get an email from them. Obviously he has been a pillar in the law community and much more, but, and of course everybody else who is helping to make these theories that he also credits and features. Uh, that That's awesome. And now Mikola awaits the return of his, his promised, promised Lord. Lord. Let's break that down. Okay. Starting with the Land of Shadow. According to interviews with Miyazaki, the Land of Shadow is a place that has become physically disconnected from the Lands Between. So this isn't an alternate version of the Lands Between, nor does it seem like we'll be going backwards or forwards in time to access the DLC for once. Yeah. And that is refreshing compared to past from software DLCs. Yeah, that's all stray. I am excited for a DLC that will expand on the present world for once, rather than a past or future world. That said, if anything, the Land of Shadow will definitely contain many remnants of the past, as it is a place obscured by the Ode Tree, where the goddess Marika first set foot. Oh boy. So this is actually ruining one of the theories that I had originally regarding the uh, lion creature like that. Now, many of you were very keen to point out that it seems like the mouth was being manipulated with hands, uh, which I didn't quite notice. But, yeah, still with the omen theme all around, the attributes of using lightning and everything, yeah, a shadowy land where these things would already still exist, but would still be frowned upon. Huh. Interesting. If this place can be obscured, simply because the Erd tree exists, then I lean towards thinking that this might have always been some sort of shadowy dimension, rather than once physically being a part of the lands between landmass, although there is a nicely sized gap <laughs> right in the middle of the lands between where this yeah, might fit. Could be. Uh, but I think the Erd tree does generate a ton of light, so the idea of a land of shadow being obscured by the Erd tree kind of makes a lot of sense. Yeah. As for why this place became obscured by the Erd tree, I think we can lay the blame squarely at the feet of Marika, since the age of the Erd tree is her age, after all, and this age only came about when she ascended to godhood and became the vessel of the Elden Ring. The biggest part that's always been missing from Marika's story is what happened before 
she became a god. Yeah. And the shadow of the Erd tree seems to hide the answers to that exact question, since the poem calls the land of shadow the place where the goddess Marika first set foot. Where the Numans Marika were. Marika setting foot in this place before setting foot in the lands Perhaps. between makes a lot of sense, because we've always known that Marika isn't from the lands between. Yeah. She's a part of the Numan race. And the Numen are said to have come from outside the lands between. Character creator calls the Numen supposed descendants of denizens of another world. So either this other world is the land of shadow and Marika originates from there, or Marika comes from somewhere outside the lands between and outside the land of shadow, but simply set foot in the land of shadow before venturing to the lands between. Either interpretation could be true at this point, I think. At any rate, it seems like the Land of Shadows is extremely important to Marika's past. Miyazaki drops a huge detail on that note, stating that the Land of Shadows is the place where Marika became a god and the Golden Tree was born. I can't wait for the DLC to elaborate on those circumstances. That's when cool. Marika did claim the Elden Ring, her most significant act was removing the Rune of Death, death. from it. Afterwards, many previous cultures of death were rendered obsolete, as souls were now supposed to return to the Erd Tree. So, if souls started to return to the Erd Tree, where, where did it go first? They were presumably reborn. Where were souls going before that? Now. This is just speculation, but is it possible souls once went to the land of shadow? Could the land of shadow once have been a sort of afterlife? I mean, as stated in that poem, Mikula accessed this place by stripping himself of his flesh. Could it be that we will also encounter Rani there? I mean, she did the same thing. Wait! Oh my god, there are a lot of connections between those two actually now. Now that I think about it, but let's keep watching. As evidence for this claim, consider that A. Mikola only managed to depart to the land of shadow when he divested himself of his grace okay. and his flesh. Should have so just waited. His death led to him being here. Next, trailer dialogue explains that those stripped of the grace of gold shall all meet death in the embrace of Mesmer's flame. flame. So those who are stripped of the grace of gold have to meet death in this place. And the last bit of evidence for this speculation is that there already is a shadowy realm of death alluded to in Elden Ring lore called the Helfen. So oh, yeah. since we know that the Erd Tree disrupted the previous cycles of death in the lands between, definitely makes sense to me that the Erd Tree might obscure the Land of Shadow beyond just being a bright source of light. Mm. It might have replaced its existence as a sort of afterlife, but I could definitely be wrong on the afterlife stuff, so let me know what you think. I keep going back to this image of the veil here that some of you have been so kind to point out are called Balderkins. Uh, an information that comes from, uh, at least from your comments, comes from a, another content creator co called Queen Lag, so shout out to her. Uh, it's also reminiscent of something from the Vatican uh, <laughs> Bible days, remember that, things. Uh, but those veils being there are obviously a sight of them hiding what should have been there in plain sight. Uh, quite interesting. At any rate, the Land of Shadow has now become relevant again for the Tarnished have found a way to enter this forsaken place. The poem goes on to read, A land purged in an unsung battle, set ablaze by Mesmer's flame. Hmm. I interpret this as the land was purged in an unsung battle, and then it was set ablaze by Mesmer's flame. These seem to be two separate things. So first, let's talk about the war unsung battle. In an interview, Miyazaki references the war when he was asked about this Wicker Man enemy, oh, and replies, beautiful. so 
This giant basket of flame was a terrible, gruesome weapon used in a war that occurred in the Land of Shadow. Of course, the kindling it. that you see is actually the remains of bodies that were put in there to burn. Yeah. As for whose Irish enemies mythology. were put inside the Wicker Man, I'd wager that it was Marika's enemies, since she's the one who came out victorious as a god and with the golden tree as well. Just speculation, though. <laughs> Zula the the berserk fan. Out that the Wicker Man... <laughs> as, as quick as I said it, freaking berserk fans coming in the clutch. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Zully the Witch points out that the Wicker Man traces its origins back to Celtic, Celtic myth, yeah. where Irish, people were Celtic, allegedly sure. sacrificed within a Wicker statue. And many other users have pointed out that this design may have instead been drawn from Berserk. Well, in Berserk, the thing was that uh, those apprentices did summon a taboo, which they were not supposed to, and got me quick work of the Wicker Man. But nevertheless, when it comes to this one, uh, I remember encountering, at least my closest memory with uh, dealing with a Wicker Man was in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. I think that I have a clip of that somewhere on the channel where, at least to like a showcase that I was making of the, the reboots of the games. But yeah, you do encounter one of these. But the sacrifices that were made were... Uh, well, at least there were four criteria for the sacrifices that were made. One was that the individuals who came in willingly, uh, in terms of the Celtic mythology, uh, one was given the power of a king. Uh, third one was um, that the, the entity could have been a virgin. And the last one was that they were a fool. Actually, there's a very brilliant movie by um, a fellow, uh, Antony. Anthony Schaefer, uh, I think that is his name, a director, at least, uh, the person who wrote the screenplay for that old movie called The Wicker Man, that I highly recommend that you check out if you're interested in anything of the sort. Uh, kind of like a cultish movie with like a police officer that has to investigate the murder. But yeah, uh, those four criteria were supposed to be the ones, but I guess that one could say that the fool in this case, uh, individual who had to face the wrath of Marika. They were never saints. They just happen to be on the losing side of a war. If you look closely, yeah. you can actually see a mane of red hair attached around a face on the Wicker Man's upper thighs. Red hair giants. Like this is referenced in the Giant's Red Braid, which reads, Every giant is red of hair, and Radigan was said to have despised his own red locks. Perhaps ah. that was a curse of their kind. Incidentally, the red... Funny enough, <laughs> Celtic, Irish culture. <laughs> yeah, a bit on the nose there, then. And hair here is just one of many symbols in the trailer that are considered blasphemous over in the lands between. Omen horns, for example, are another such symbol of despised beings under the Golden Order. And omen horns are seen here on the Wicker Man, here upon the Lion Dancer, here on these enemies, and even upon the roaring rune bear thing, which also has that red hair. Yeah. And then there's this hippo thing that's using an aspect of the Crucible, which were also aspects that became despised After the Golden scorned. Order. And then there's a spirit wielding the Iron Cleaver that's the signature weapon of the Misbegotten, who were also despised. So... Lots of blasphemous symbols going on, but no character in the DLC has as many of them as Mesmer, <laughs> who is the character that is at the heart of the Shadow of the Oed Tree DLC. Maybe even more so than Mikola. It's like an amalgamation this of all of them. the demigod who would set ablaze the land of Shadow. Mother, wouldst thou truly lordship Samson? In one so bereft of light. So this is Mesma, and the mother he mentions is Queen Marika. Hmm. An official interview makes this quite clear. To quote Miyazaki, and you may have seen at the end of the trailer, there was this piece of key art where it shows Mesma sat in this oh, throne-like chair. Yeah. And people who've played the game may recognize this Under throne the tree. to be one of those from the boss room where you battle Morgoth. And this represents the thrones at the base of the Erd tree. 
and yeah. it's supposed to symbolize that Mesma stands on equal footing to these other demigods and children of Marika who sat around in these thrones and held the rooms of the Erd Tree. So he is an important figure who rivals these other demigods. And as you play the DLC, you will learn a little about why he wasn't featured in The Legends of the Erd Tree, The Lands Between. You'll realize why he exists in this shadow, this land of shadow. As to who <laughs> Mesmer's father is, well, there are Radigan. many signs that they're a product of Radigan. For one, there's the red hair, and then there's the fact that Mesmer's name starts with M, which suits the naming convention for the children of Marika Radigan, who are Mikola, Melania, yeah. and possibly Melina. Melina. The interesting thing is, though, that it would be way better fitting now to have him instead of Melina, as mentioned in my theory. Also, just in terms of, like, body structure. Like, while I would have speculated originally that, yeah, he has the lanky kind of uh, body that um, uh, Morgoth, yes, that Morgoth has, <laughs> Margot the Fell, <laughs> no, that Morgoth has, and of course the um, serpentine feature that uh, Moog has. Uh, perhaps that could have been an amalgamation of that, but no, quite literally, Melania is, has that elongated body, giant-like. So is her father, and so is Mikola, even in his cocoon. So, Melania featuring in there, being more human? I don't know. She must be of something else. Just like with, um, uh, what's her name? Just like, um, what's her name? Melisent? Who might be a descendant of Melania, somehow? In the same way that, uh, uh God... Godric, yeah, Godric also comes or descends from <sighs> Millicent. I think very much, I think very much like Millicent, for example, who seems to de descend from the lineage of M Melania. It could be the same thing with Melina. We, we don't know in the same light that, well, okay, Godric is a bit more on the nose with that, but he had zero power and went with a grafting instead. Speaking of Melina, we've talked many times about the butterfly theory, which posits mm. that all children of Radic and Marika have a butterfly of their own. Yeah. Mikola's is the nascent butterfly, Melania's is the Aeonian butterfly, and since They're Melina smoldering. is the kindling maiden, We've long speculated that hers was the smoldering butterfly, but now it seems that butterfly could belong to Mesma instead, given yeah. his much more overt flame symbolism. That said, there is a fourth pink butterfly featured in the trailer now, yeah. so it's possible the butterfly theory might still have wings. <laughs> if Mesmer was legitimately born alongside the other children of Marika Radigan, that actually places his existence a little bit later in the timeline. Still in the age of the Erd Tree, but after Radigan left Renala for Marika. Whatever the case, Mesmer would find himself in the Land of Shadow, delivering death to those stripped of the grace of gold. Those stripped of the grace of gold shall all meet death in the embrace of Mesmer's flame. Since this line is delivered by a third party, it seems there's a common belief here that Mesmer's role is to deliver death to those stripped of grace who yeah. find themselves He's the in fairy the man. land of shadow, including but a deadly one. apparently our tarnished who finds themselves at odds with Mesmer. What a shot. Mother, wouldst thou truly lordship sanction in one so bereft of light? In this dialogue, I think Mesmer is questioning why Marika has seen fit to restore grace to the tarnished and sanction their lordship, guiding mm. them to become Elden Lord even though in his eyes, we are bereft of light. 
Mesmer but. strikes me as a bit of a rebel and an outcast. He's not what you'd expect from someone who is clearly killing people who have been stripped of the grace of gold. But I do ultimately think that he holds Marika in high regard. I do think he's doing this on her behalf. The but. fact that he sits on a demigod's throne might be evidence enough, uh, but in an excellent bit of photo manipulation by user usa69 on reddit we can clearly spy a statue hey. of what seems to be marika mm. in the background Holding a baby it has her signature braid and her armband as well and uniquely she's holding a baby who could be mesmer but mm. that's just speculation we know marika uses people even oh, her sorry. enemies even the blasphemous she will keep a fire giant alive just so it can watch over something for eternity she will disguise herself as radigan make her biggest rival fall in love with him and then abandon that rival and undo them from within Jeez. she will condemn the misbegotten and then get one of them to the craft race weapons war. for a tarnished so that they can become elden lord so, in a similar way, I feel like Mesmer being useful to Marika, despite very clearly being a blasphemous character, really isn't that strange. No. But what do I mean about Mesmer being blasphemous? I mean, Jesus Christ, can she just have children that are normal? Like, it's, it, it's also your fault, man. <laughs> you were the one who brought them to life. And you knew... You most likely knew what was going to happen with either Godfrey. Well, I guess that the, the children of Renala are not straight up blasphemous. Only um, Rikard decided to do it of his own volition to go with the, the blasphemous serpent. But <laughs> come on. Well, first, there's the snakes. According to the Gravekeeper Cloak, the snake is viewed as a traitor to the Erd Tree. And now we don't know if they're talking about Mesmer's snake or the Great Serpent, which is what we assumed before. Whatever the case, there's no way that Mesmer's snakes would be looked upon favorably by the Golden Order. In the Erdtree Colosseums, for example, mm. the audience delighted in seeing the bronze snakes on the armor of the gladiators be beaten and battered. And then there's Mesmer's usage of flame. According to the Spark aromatic, fire was prohibited to those who served the Erd Tree. Okay. And while this rule was forgotten as the war drew ever on, I do think Mesmer might have some links to the flame of the Fell God, if I had to guess. He's got the red hair, and snakes do appear on the giant's flame forge in the mountaintops, but I'll admit these connections are pretty shaky. We don't know exactly sure. what kind of flame Mesmer is using just yet. Lastly, Mesmer clearly has a connection to Dragon Communion. I was about to is say. also something that's frowned upon. So Dragon Communion snake. is the abhorrent act of consuming the hearts of dragons to commune with the ancient dragons and become more like them. According to the Magma Worm's Scale Sword, Dragon Communion is a grave transgression for which many partakers were cursed to crawl on their bellies as shadows of their former selves. As evidence for Mesmer's Communion, his one good eye is yellow and slitted. Which, which we get is a clear when symptom we do the communion. Consuming the dragon hearts that even our tarnished gets afflicted with. Yeah. And, not to mention, his winged armor looks a lot like the Drake Knight set, which is a set that labels the Drake Knights as partakers of communion. Then there's this symbol on the box art, and even the fire he conjures that looks a little bit like the dragon communion seal, but it's not a one-to-one -one match. Ben. And then serpents themselves are considered imperfect dragons, in Dark Souls lore, at least. And... Mesmer's serpents are sprouting draconic wings, so... I mean, <laughs> I, I, I've always thought this about Elden Ring, but like there are a lot of like, si like similitude that could be drawn to uh, Christianity, you know, a lot of the themes that, uh, that, that are made, that seem like Bible references, even the snake is always called the great dragon 
of the end. So, yeah, referring to the devil himself. There could be something there. On this promotional page, we also learn that Mesmer's full title is Mesmer the, the Impaler. Impaler. And it could be that this name simply comes from his fighting style, but I will also point out, as many others have already, that there is a catacomb in the lands yeah. between called the Impaler's Catacombs. So there's one cat it's in there. <laughs> he got this reputation from certain deeds that he committed in the lands between. Of all the characters I can think of, only the fire giants and Marika come to mind as ever being, being impaled. impaled. The fire giant's stakes aren't identical to Mesmer's spear, but yeah. they are similar. And Marika being impaled at the end of the game never really had a good explanation, so maybe this is a chance for them to explain that, finally. So, in conclusion, I get the vibe that Mesma is this rebellious, kind of blasphemous child, but that they're still loyal and, more importantly, still useful to their mother, who is yeah. Marika. Best so, mom. Of course, all my opinions and speculations in this video, <laughs> especially, are very subject to change. Next, let's talk about Mikola. Your Highness. Mikola is many things. He is the demigod son of Queen Marika and her consort Radigan. He is Mikola the Nascent, cursed with eternal youth. He is Mikola the Unalloyed, who sought to find a cure for his sister's scarlet rot. He is Saint Trina, an alter ego who go? deals in sleep and dreams. And he is Mikola of the Halig Tree, a sort of Erd tree that he eventually embedded himself within. He's also the subject of an hour-long lore video on my channel. I should watch that. I'm also going to be talking about him again <laughs> later this week in a lore video about Moog, so please forgive me for being brief in my description of him here. Oh no. I like watching the Prepare to Cries videos that he has made. There's one specific uh, that I think uh, I'm gonna be absolutely shattered by. He did one on Morgoth. Because that that boy, <laughs> that man, he suffered. He suffered a lot. He was only trying to be a good son. Suffice to say though, Mikola is a very important demigod. He's also an Empyrean, which means he is a rare character eligible to become a god and succeed Queen Marika. The most feared Additionally, according to his sister. his sister says that he is the most fearsome Empyrean of all, and that he possesses the wisdom, the allure of a god. It's this allure that has led to his fate in the base game, yeah. which is to say he appears to be dead at the hands of Moog, who is Mikola's demigod half-brother. Moog ripped Mikola's cocoon out of the Halig tree and abducted him. But also, he was giant. Look at that. From that size to... Holy shit. Bruh. How? <laughs> was he turning into a giant? What the hell? Now, Mikola's cocooned flesh lies in Mogwin Palace, and his withered arm there will become the entrance to the DLC. Miyazaki elaborates on this point, stating that Mikola has traveled to the land of shadow for his own reasons, and it's up to the player to follow in his footsteps, as many other NPCs also have before you. The poem reads, it was to this land that Mikola departed, divesting himself of his flesh, his strength, his lineage, of all things golden. The fact that Mikola has divested himself of his flesh reminds me a lot of Rani, who slays her own flesh intentionally in order to free her from the control of the two fingers. Through his own death, it seems, he has departed to the land of shadow, though now he is without his strength. He's also likely divested himself from his great rune, which is probably this one seen here, which takes the same shape as this emote you get for pre-ordering, yeah. which is called Ring of Mikola. So all of this should explain why he needs you. The poem continues, 
and now Mikola awaits the return of his promised Just a part I don't quite get. If I had to guess where we're ultimately headed, it would be the castle here, right beneath the shadow of the Erd Tree. Here, an Ark is catching the bounty of the Erd Tree, just like the Runarks do. And the sky above is enwreathed by these ethereal cloth tapestries. According to Miyazaki, these tapestries are a veil, and they are a symbol of the Land of Shadows being hidden from the world outside. Right. And speaking of veils, the Black Knives are assassins that are invisible due to their concealing veils. And we have a talisman that is a part of those veils, put together from dark cloth with a lustrous sheen mm. that completely hides the wearer's presence. Earlier, we talked about how Marika was likely responsible for the Land of Shadow being concealed or veiled, and according to the Black Knife Armor, the Black Knives are rumored to be Newman who had close ties with Marika herself. What do you know? So maybe we're already starting to understand the nature of this veil. That said, the way this veil is laid brings to mind a lot of things. At first it reminded America's me chambers. of America's bedchambers. Yeah. Then I thought maybe it could represent Moog's bloody bedchamber, as he puts it. Or it could even represent the Baldekins of the Deathbed Companions, yeah. which, according to the Baldekins' blessings, are hidden temples in the guise of a bedchamber. Huh. This could represent Mikola's long-awaited rebirth, or maybe his eternal nascence. It could even represent the fact that he is Saint Trina, an alter ego sleep. that has to do with sleep and dreams. So many things. Speaking of Saint Trina... Oh! Okay, so, so, something very stupid here, because I've been reading upon some uh, biology recently. Uh, iguanas. Iguanas have a third eye which is located like a little bit on top of their head. But the interesting thing, it's not an actual eye, right? It's just a bunch of cells located there that almost form an eye. It allows them to detect shadows upon them to make sure that uh, predators from above will not catch them. So it allows them to see the shadow. Uh, but just thinking about that, looking at the third eye, that's usually what um, I think a lot of association might have come from with the idea of a third eye allowing, allowing people to see beyond the natural because they observe that in animals. Well, at least if I had to give a natural explanation as to why people went to that idea of such a member being embedded in the body, uh, that would likely be the, the reason as to why. But also, some individual might point out the pineal gland, which is also sometimes considered to be a third eye by potheads. So <laughs> there's also that one. Yeah, though, there's a brief shot of a masked character who looks like they're sleeping in a purple swamp. The droopy flowers in the background might be St. Trina's lilies, and the purple haze of this swampy area definitely gives off sleep effect vibes. Hmm. You might recall when Rani first meets with you in Elden Ring, she does so amidst a mist, which has put Kale oh, and his yeah. donkey to sleep nearby. And the more I think about it, the more I think this encounter might have to do with Mikola. In this moment, Rani gives you Torrent. the spirit calling bell and three wolves, which she says are from Torrent's former master. But yeah, I was thinking about the conversation. And considering we see what looks to be Mikola riding Torrent here in the Land of Shadow, I think we can reason that Torrent is Mikola's steed and thus that Mikola has given you gifts via Rani and favored you ever since the very beginning of the game. But the rabbit hole goes deeper because Melina is the one who gives you Torrent's whistle at the start of the game. And since we've now learned that Torrent was likely in the Land of Shadow with Mikola, does that mean that Melina would have ventured to the Land of Shadow yeah. to retrieve Torrent Isn't from she the one telling at us? some point. Remember, Melina's origins are largely unresolved in Elden Ring, so I really hope we learn more about her story in this place. The fact that she might have traveled to a land that's enwreathed in Mesmer's flame 
might also explain why she's burned Kindling. and bodiless, but now I'm just engaging in unhinged speculation and these theories might have got out of hand. But let me do unhinged speculation on one more thing, and I want to draw your attention to the fact that we've learned that it's necessary to kill Radan to access the DLC. Oh? That's curious. It seems to hint that his death is essential for events in the Land of Shadow to make sense. Logically, this would be related to the meteor shower that happens after no you crime. kill him, right? Because it's <gasps> in this moment that the fate in the night sky is suddenly let free. Also, for those who mention Noctella as a possible location for that one entity that I suppose was from um, Rhylocaria, it was put even more credence to them because those are the people who come from underground. Perhaps Melania was even chasing this world state where fate is freed from the night sky and maybe she was sent here to kill Radan on behalf of Mikola when she fought him all those years ago. What's crazy is we still don't know why Melania fought Radan, so hopefully we get an answer for that as well. And of course most of you won't have to worry about killing Radan as your characters are likely already at the end of the story. <laughs> Speaking of the end of the story, Miyazaki's recent interview reveals that they don't currently have plans to make a second DLC for Elden Ring, so whatever ending that's coming with Mikola might be the final one. Oh. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's shaping up to be a good ending with Mikola. Oh no. Pure and radiant, he wields love to shrive clean the hearts of men. There is nothing more, more terrifying. terrifying. To shrive is to hear confession, to assign penance and absolve someone. It sounds like a pretty harrowing process, and that is a perfect match for Mikola, who is described as both benevolent and fearsome. This is that ominous love of Mikola, which is a really unique vibe, and I'm very excited to see where things will go. Kill them with Believe kindness. It or not, I've still got a lot of the trailer to break down, but first, I'd like to finally reveal this. This is the Shadow of the Great Tree, a unique displate design. Oh, that that's cool. I wanted to create where you can flip it upside down and get a completely different perspective. There's two prints in one here. So this way, it's the giant tree with roots snaking through the city below in the second half. But put the other way, it's a city with the trees of the underworld holding up the world. This is all made possible thanks to Displate's innovative magnet system where prints can be easily stuck onto walls in whatever orientation you'd like without damaging your walls at all. If you get in quick, you can get this print for 22% off with the link below, and if you add any other prints to that order, you'll get 33% off everything, no matter what else you add to your cart. I have a whole set of other prints that you can browse on my page, or you can even get official Elden Ring prints on display. So I'll leave a link to all of that in the description as well. Thank you for supporting my videos with any purchases you make. Let me quick fire some observations at you before I go, since there's a lot I couldn't quite fit into the previous parts of the video. First, this is my favorite enemy design in the trailer. <laughs> you bet. Its body is actually made up of three or four robed humanoid beings, and they're all coordinating together to puppeteer this beast. Yeah. Just like the traditional lion Chinese dances dragon, yeah. from Chinese culture. Okay. It's amazingly inspired. So. According to Miyazaki, there was a culture that existed before the Golden Tree, and the Lion Dancer is derived from that culture. So it was that. Okay, I, I was supposing that uh, it had a lot more to do with an actual entity, but yeah, I didn't quite catch the whole thing with the people who were using the body. I Obviously, I saw that from the movements, but yeah. Yet still, I want to know... Where from did he acquire the lion head? Did Siraj actually have like a, 
family of his own could be interesting to know because he was just a shadow as well for Godfrey. Next up, this character who sits alone in a room filled with debris, Quaylarg over on YouTube has acutely noted that they look very much like the scholar who appears upon the Carrion inverted statue, yeah. which is a key item given to you by Rani during mm. her questline. The area they appear in seems to also feature the many bird cages of Raya Lucaria, yeah. so it's exciting to see that we might be learning more about some of the glintstone sorcerers. Okay, Next, so back to Raya Lucaria. wears the deep navy hood of expatriated royalty. That's the... <laughs> That's actually the robe that I used in my video. I did change the gloves uh, when I was recording footage. But yeah, uh, we know who they are, the, the, the royal outfit. And the hood was gifted to those who saw the guidance of grace, who then departed on missions to faraway lands, from which they would never return. Yeah. They cast a completely new spell type, and in the background we see lion statues with omen horns, and the fact that these lions with omen horns are venerated might suggest that this was from a time when horns were seen as signifiers of the divine and yeah. not symbols of ill omen. Also, I was so excited to see this player cast these golden wings. We have many aspects of the crucible spells, but we and can we do never cast the, the wings. wings, which until this point were only able to be utilized by the Crucible Knights. Yeah. And I don't think that's the only new Crucible spell we're getting access to. Yeah. A new screenshot shows the Tarnished using these golden porcupine spines, the same ones utilized by this hippo. deformed hippo enemy after it charges. And the sound it makes is just like a Crucible spell. True Reaver demons. Oh, go ahead, upgrade the hippo, one of the deadliest mammals on earth, with porcupine spines. Thank you. Oh, and I wonder if this pot thrown by the player character is a spell or a consumable or a weapon art. And speaking of new screenshots, I want to know the story behind this guy. I will protect him with my life. Worm. It seems like he appears in this same field of blue flowers, which, if you look carefully, has that grave that has a hole in it that you find in <laughs> Morn's castle. There's also, of course, this red dancer character. There are a couple of dancer characters in Elden Ring. We have the blue dancer, now we have a red one. Cool. So maybe she's... Power Rangers. Oh, and I also adore the design on this guy who is attempting this impossible task of wrenching a sort of spinal golden rib cage through a hole in his skull. Interested to see what happens after that. No. And if you look closely at his robes, you'll notice he's actually the same character as the man in this portrait at another point in the trailer. So there's clearly a story here, especially if they're worthy of a portrait, right? Next to this man is a- It could be like an entity that has yet to meet death by Mesmer's flames, so just eternally stuck there like a zombie or something, but fully conscious. A woman who looks a little bit like a deathbed companion. The origins of the deathbed companions were alluded to in the base game, so it seems kind of fitting that we might explore those origins further in the Land of Shadow. Skelly sleepers. I also wonder if this enemy could be a knight of Radan. They use gravitational magic, as a lot of his knights do. Uh, they're also armored somewhat similarly, and they ride a boar, and Radan's helmet has boar-like tusks, so that might be a thing. Uh, but there's just too much to speculate over. Could this armor be related to the knight's cavalry? This Twitter user points out that Mesmer's statue looks a lot like the pose of the clean rot knight. Is there a reason for that? Mm. Could these black knights with gold trim be related to Malekith? Are the people who are wearing nah. masks part of House Mirai? Why is the top of this castle blackened and disintegrating into the sky? <sighs> Why is there a line of birds standing before you in this swamp? Is this character afflicted by frenzy? Are they a worm face? Their posture 
is kind of similar. But much more elongated limbs. Jesus Christ, actually, I didn't quite notice what this was to begin with. Yeah. And what are those... I, I don't even... I don't even know. Are we getting rune bear communion spells? And a huge question. Why does Mesmer only have one functioning eye? So many questions, but I guess it'll have to wait. Subscribe for more Elden Ring lore <laughs> in the coming weeks. And subscribe to keep up with all the biggest news regarding the DLC. Thank you to MissPap1 for helping me with the edit for this video and thank you to all of those I referenced in this video and in the description. Check out the new displate if you're interested and thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. This was cool. Oh, this was really cool. I like how the Elden Ring community, while well, these from soft and their games as uh, overall have turned us fans into actual freaking detectives. Like, we are so investigative when it comes to all of these things, and I love it. It's so nerdy, it, it makes me rejoice. But guys, thank you so much for checking out this video. As always, please do make sure to go and subscribe to Vatividia, and of course, like the video if you enjoyed it. And I wish you all to have a wonderful day. See you guys in the next one. Bye.